Now it's uh, an honor to introduce our final panel for the conference addressing the latest developments on Iran and the uh, Trump's foreign policy crisis du jour. Uh, to help us through what happens next, we're lucky to be joined by Avril Haines, uh, by Jake Sullivan, by Ariana Taba Tabai, and by Brian Katulis, uh, who will moderate the panel, a senior fellow at CAP uh, who covers and leads on the Middle East at CAP. You'll be moderating the uh, conversation. Brian, I turn it over to you. Thank you uh, all for uh, coming today and staying for the full day and for this final panel. I'm Brian Katulis with the Center for American Progress. I know uh, every day it seems like uh, President Trump's national security approach it seems like a daily train wreck uh, across the board. And on Iran in particular, it feels like a train wreck. But let's be clear, we are where we are today on Iran uh, by no accident. What Pre President Trump is implementing right now is a, an approach which is erratic, it's confused, but it's the product of a very concerted effort to undermine what I thought was very important work done under the Obama administration to try to stabilize the Middle East. And many of the people in the room here uh, were part of that, either inside of the government or outside. And we have a great panel, which, which John has already introduced, and I'm not going to go through the bios and things like that. What we're going to do today um, is have a bit of a conversation for a few minutes, talking about where are we and where do we go from here. That's the main thrust. But then we're going to draw you in, because there's so much expertise, and it's such an important issue. Uh, 2020 has started uh, with, I think, a very negative uh, and, and in, fa in fact, frightening note for, for most folks. And again, uh, Center for American Progress for years has been at the core of this. Uh, many years ago, we released a strategy called Contain and Engage. And I think I saw Joe Cirincione here earlier and Andy Grotto uh, were authors of that. And again, as Larry just said, these ideas were templates. These were ideas that... Uh, uh, offered thoughts about where to go, and I think in some ways this informed where things went in a constructive way. But what we're going to do today is assess the Category 5 hurricane that we're experiencing right now, try to gauge where we're going to be uh, a year from now, if we can, and talk about where do we go from here. Um, so let me first start with Ari Ariana, uh, Ariane um, from RAND. Um, it would start where we should start, which is with Iran, in the region and the implications of what's happened, not just in the past week or 10 days, uh, but of the Trump strategy. So take us through that, and then we'll talk about uh, how we got here with policy and where do we go from here. Thanks, Brian and Kat, for having me and uh, for this very timely conversation. Um, so because, I guess, we've had basically one news cycle per hour since the beginning of 2020, I thought I would start with a bit of an overview of what is going on domestically in Iran as we speak. There is a lot going on. Then talk a little bit about the region, and then, uh, because that's not enough, to wrap it up with the nuclear issue. Sure. Um, so in November, as everyone remembers, uh, in Iran there were a number of protests. Um, people were in the United States uh, wondering if the regime was about to collapse um, any second. Uh, the regime was very effective and efficient in uh, cracking down, and, and more so than it had been in the past. Uh, over the course of 72 hours, they shot down the internet, killed several hundred people, uh, and essentially managed to get the protests under control. Then, of course, the uh, president uh, allowed, uh, authorized the killing of Soleimani, and it seemed like everything changed overnight, where people in Iran uh, were no longer protesting corruption, mismanagement, incompetence uh, from their own government, and they had turned their attention to supporting and rallying around it, uh, and uh, essentially protesting the U.S. action and decision to kill Soleimani. Uh, so the conversation changed massively, and of course, then the IRGC came out and took responsibility, uh, kind of shockingly, actually. It's not something they typically do. They're not uh, a, an organization that is known for accountability, for taking responsibility. Uh, and they did that for a change, uh, saying that you know, they had down the um, airliner uh, accidentally, uh, and uh, they tried to take responsibility for that. And that, of course, started the protests all over again, uh, which are ongoing as we speak. Um, they've been going on for three days. 
Uh, so, you know, this has us all wondering what's going on in Iran, what do we make of it, how does it feed into U.S. policy, um, and as a political scientist and as someone who's been alive over the past few years and has watched public opinion um, kind of go up and down in this country, I think it's really important that we recognize just how um, fragile and how unpredictable and unreliable public opinion can be. And to, hold it to, and to hold two ideas in our heads, that it is possible for the Iranian people to, at the same time, be frustrated with their own government, uh, believe that it is incompetent, corrupt, uh, and that it has put them where they are today, while at the same time wanting to prevent a conflict with the United States, uh, just bearing in mind that for mo the majority of Iranians today, the Iran-Iraq war is not just something they read about in the history books, it's something they grew up with. It's something that they've experienced, their families have experienced, and so for them, the concept of a conflict with a superior adversary uh, is essentially a reminding them of their cities getting bombed and people having to go down to shelters to uh, make sure that they don't end up dead. Uh, so, you know, they can have these two ideas at the same time. They can be opposed and frustrated to their own government, but they can also want to make sure that things don't escalate and show unity uh, and rally behind their government in the face of a foreign adversary. So, in my view, uh, one thing that the current administration is not doing well enough um, and that we should be bearing in mind is uh, that you know, it's all fine to wish for the regime's collapse and hope for a liberal democracy in Iran. I think we can all agree that that would be fantastic and we all want that, but not to plan for it, not to make policy based on this notion that the regime is about to collapse um, this year or even in, in a decade and we should be really thinking about uh, our national security and interests and put those um, at, at the forefront rather than hoping for something to happen. Uh, so that brings me actually to the question of the region and the maximum pressure campaign and how that's been uh, playing out. Uh, I think if we're generous with uh, the administration's maximum pressure campaign, uh, we can say that it has had some tactical successes here and there. Uh, for example, if we take the administration's word at its face, at, at face value, uh, you know, Brian Hook says this quite frequently, Secretary Pompeo has alluded to this. Uh, Iran may have less cash to be sending to non-state groups in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, and that's a good thing, right? Uh, but to me, the, the point of the maximum pressure campaign, again, if we take the administration's own stated objectives uh, at face value, is not to have some tactical successes here and there, is to seek a fundamental change in behavior along the 12 points that Secretary Pompeo has laid out. And there, um, I think it is quite clear today that as of right now, uh, that has been essentially a failure, uh, that Iran has not changed its behavior. In fact, it has doubled down on a lot of the behavior that we find so problematic. Um, and it has pushed the envelope in a way that it hadn't uh, in recent years. Uh, and it has done so very visibly. Uh, you know, the fact that you had uh, the strikes against uh, uh, bases in Iraq uh, directly trying to target U.S. interests uh, and presence in Iraq uh, is, uh, is something that I think we can attribute to how, uh, to the cycle of escalation that has brought us to where we are today. We're seeing a similar uh, situation with the nuclear file. Uh, Iran, of course, announced last week in the middle of all this that it was taking the fifth and they've said final step uh, to dial down compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, we don't really know what that entails quite yet, in, a, uh, in contrast to some of the previous uh, steps that they had announced, which were very practical, quite concrete. Uh, this time around, this was more of a political statement. Um, they said that you know, they were going to uh, see themselves as no longer bound by the limits of, uh, that, that were imposed on their enrichment program. But they haven't said exactly what they're going to do next. So we have to stay tuned and see uh, how that plays out, what actions they actually take uh, concretely, if any. Uh, and at least from my perspective, and I think from a U.S. national security perspective, it's good news that they're uh, continuing to work with the IAEA, that they're not uh, actually doing anything to dial down uh, the access of the agency and its inspectors to Iranian facilities and the nuclear program. Uh, but certainly in the next few months, we will find out what they uh, intend to do. Uh, the Europeans having triggered the dispute re uh, resolution mechanism today may add more to their calculus and may lead them to, to take more action. But again, here too, we have seen Iran just doubling down on uh, and, and pushing the, the, the envelope on its nuclear program rather than scaling it back uh, as the administration had hoped. So, um, you know, in general, you asked me to sort of give you my assessment. It's quite bleak. I think we've actually taken quite a few steps backwards instead of taking steps forward. 
uh, in terms of changing uh, all the uh, behavior and actions and policies that we find so troubling with Iran. So, so the risks are increased, the outcomes are oh, close to nil. Um, I want to turn to Jake because you were, uh, of course, involved with Bill Burns and others in the first uh, engagement uh, with Iran that led to the JCPOA, uh, ultimately. From a policy perspective, how did we get here? I mean, I think we all understand it. But then where do we go from here next? And later on in the conversation, as hard as it will be, we'll try to imagine where we might be in a year. But if you were advising today, how do you reel things back and get things back on track? What would you do? Well, I think most people, first of all, that was just a phenomenal uh, lay down and incredibly efficient as well in, in capturing the totality of this. So I, I won't um, go in detail through how we got here. I'll just make an observation, which is that the maximum pressure campaign theoretically is about producing the quote unquote better deal. Um, but really, at the end of the day, the sanctions are the strategy. The pressure is the point. Because the administration's view is that as long as they're putting pressure on Iran, something good is going to happen. Maybe, just maybe, the regime will collapse. But even if it doesn't collapse, maybe they'll come out with their hands up and agree to the 12 points or something close to them. But even if they don't come out and, and uh, put their hands up and accept the 12 points, at least we're squeezing them in ways that weaken them, distract them, make their lives more difficult both in the region and at home. So as far as the administration's concerned, leave aside their stated objective of the better deal and look at their actual objective, they feel like this is working. They've just got Iran in a, in a world in which it's, it's um, feeling pressure, it's feeling squeezed. Now, I think they also believe that a free Iran is just around the corner, which is a dangerous assumption for them to be making right now. But that's basically the reason that we are where we are, because the Trump administration essentially said, we can impose all of this pressure. And I think what they forgot was that Iran wasn't just going to fold. It had cards to play, too. And it, it had three cards, moving the nuclear program forward, uh, attacking shipping and oil infrastructure in the Gulf, and then making life worse for the United States in terms of its presence across the region. It was the third of those in the attack on the proxy attack that killed the American contractor that led to the Soleimani killing. But even if we set the Soleimani killing aside, today Iran still has those three tools and still over the course of the coming months is likely to exercise those tools in various ways, to keep moving its program forward, to keep threatening at least the supply of energy through the Gulf, even if they don't take further action, and to keep putting pressure on the US presence in Iraq and other places. Now, the Europeans came out today and basically said, um, we see where you're going, especially on this nuclear issue, and we don't like it. So we're triggering the dispute resolution mechanism under the JCPOA. I think they're doing so not to kill the JCPOA, but rather to try to deter Iran and to get Iran back into some modest form of compliance. So it's very difficult to predict where we will be on January 20th, 2021. It's hard to predict where we will be on January 20th, 2020. Um, and a lot of us have made predictions, some of which have borne out and others haven't quite borne out. But just for the sake of argument, let's assume that the JCPOA is terminal, but not entirely blown up. It, it exists on life support, basically, a year from now. That there's uh, instability in the region, but not outright war. And a Democratic president is elected and comes into office. I think that there are two fundamental projects that need to be undertaken simultaneously, and they're connected to one another. The first is figuring out how you reestablish nuclear diplomacy in a way that isn't just going straight back into the JCPOA, calling it a day and walking away, but is re-entering an arrangement with the Iranians on the nuclear file that also seeks to secure longer-term guarantees with respect to nuclear restrictions, and sequencing that diplomacy at a moment when the Iranians will be heading into their own presidential election later that spring will be very complicated. And it will require deep consultations with our allies and partners who will have their own ideas for what to do about it. And then the second is how to think about the regional file in connection with the nuclear file. In the Obama administration, we essentially said we're going to do the nuclear issue 
and then not tie our hands one way or the other in terms of our ability to deal with Iran's regional activities. The Trump argument is you have to do this all together as a single negotiation. I don't think the Trump argument makes a whole lot of sense. The United States sitting across the table from Iran and negotiating the proper Iranian role in Iraq or Syria or Lebanon doesn't actually compute. Like, how do we work that out? That requires a regional negotiation that the United States can participate in or underwrite or play a role in, and that should be connected to but on a parallel track from the nuclear file. And coming up with a way to sequence and engage conversations among the regional actors about what a long-term de-escalation looks like at the same time that we're executing a nuclear uh, play, <laughs> that is immensely complicated but I think necessary for whoever the next president is. And, and I'll just close by saying I don't know whether to be to see a silver lining in the cloud that the Saudis and the Emiratis have looked at this period of instability and chaos over the last several months and started to put out feelers across the Gulf to say, hey, maybe we should find a different way forward here. Um, that may or may not be the case a year from now, but I think we have to try to take advantage of the fact that there seems to have been a sobering up to a certain extent of the various players in the region about what a longer term outcome might look like and we should lean into that and not immediately assume that um, there is no possibility, there is no space for regional diplomacy. And I would just say it sh we shouldn't hold the nuclear file hostage to regional diplomacy, but nor should we see them as completely distinct. We have to somehow see the connection between the two. Uh, and how you get into the specifics of that, I think, will be one of the big pieces of business going forward. So I'll leave it there. Great. Uh, thanks, Jake. Um, Avril, um, Ariane gave us sort of a great picture of where we are right now with Iran and in the region, and Jake uh, started us down the path of how we got here and where we go from here. I want to hit the pause button uh, because this is an important issue I want to ask you about, and it's one that's still very present right now in the Congress, and it's related to not just the Soleimani strike, but strikes all around the world. Uh, as you know, you know, there's a big debate uh, that we're having in this country, and many in the room here uh, take part in it with their expertise and thoughts, and a lot of our colleagues do, about uh, who has the authority to, to go to war. And it's, it's, a, it's a debate within our system here, <laughs> in our democracy. But it's also got international legal implications. So I thought we'd hit pause and say, where are we on that debate? Where do you see sort of the action in Congress? How do you see, importantly, also the international dimension of how the United States has been conducting strikes like these, like the one against Soleimani, but then, if not too ambitious, uh, more broadly? You know, where are we in terms of constraining, constraining the executive? And you sat on it on the other side as the deputy national security advisor and someone you know, who, who served in the administration, and you were on the Hill uh, before, too. So give us your thoughts on that. Simple topic. Yeah, exactly. In, yeah. in two minutes or yeah, less, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, let me start with the international legal piece because I think that's worthwhile and it it really connects in many respects to the policy pictures that both Ariana and Jacob identified. I, from a from a U.S. perspective, um, the way we've interpreted international law it provides a basis for taking action like the action against Soleimani only in three really circumstances. One is when you have a UN Security Council resolution that actually allows for that action, authorizes it, or in self-defense or collective self-defense, right? And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, or when you have the consent of the country in which you are operating and the action that you're taking is otherwise lawful. Right. We know that number three is not an option here because Iraq was very clear about the fact that they did not provide consent for this action. Right. So we end up coming back to the second criteria, this sort of self-defense, right? And recognizing that there are a lot of conflicting statements that have come out of the administration uh, since the strike. Um, it did seem, at least at first, as if they were claiming that they were acting on an imminent threat in that circumstance. And uh, under international law, the United States has taken the view that you can, in fact, take action against an imminent threat. Um, under international law as well, you have to do so uh, in a necessary and proportionate way. And so all three of those things are terms where people spend a fair amount of time trying to unpack what they mean. How broadly do we you know, interpret imminence? How broadly do we interpret necessary and proportionate? Um, and I think you know, 
first of all, the facts that have been discussed really uh, do not necessarily add up to imminence from my perspective. Even with a fairly broad interpretation by the Obama administration, I mean, the Attorney General gave a speech where he talked about the kinds of the factors that you look at for imminence, and he talked about there being a window of opportunity within which you have to act, that if you don't act in that window of opportunity, that otherwise there will be harm, essentially, that there will be killing of your citizens or otherwise. Um, and third, the likelihood that the action that you take actually reduces the chances of further attacks coming forward. And I would say that the case hasn't been made publicly for those uh, considerations. And so then you get to this question of even if we were acting in self-defense in another country without their consent, is that lawful under international law? And Again, the United States has taken the perspective that, yes, that can be lawful when you judge that that country is unwilling or unable to address the threat. So why does this matter? And I mean, I think that's one of the, the critical questions that people ask themselves in this context. And I, it matters from my perspective on a whole series of levels. One is I actually believe in international law, and I think international law serves the United States in a range of ways that if we just start saying that we don't care about it or not making the case for it or all of those things, that we basically deteriorate or, or denigrate international law in ways. And I'd say that this whole issue around imminence and the way in which we're approaching it is one aspect of the problem, but things like tweets about the fact that you could target cultural sites, which is yeah. a clear war crime, or that you can take action that's disproportionate, also not acceptable under the law of war. Uh, you know, doing things like not giving a visa, unfortunately, to Zarif if you don't have a valid basis for doing it. All of those things add up to the United States sort of disregarding international law in ways that I think is honestly challenging then for our partners and allies who want to be able to stand with us and say some of these, are, you know, the Iranian actions that are being taken are unacceptable, are illegitimate, all of those things when they have challenges with the position that the United States and the President of the United States is taking. And it's also concerning for Iraq, which is relying on us, in effect, to respect its sovereignty and its territory, and when we're asking and, and continuing to rely on their permission in this context. And it's also deeply depressing, frankly, I think, for many service members who are around the world trying to train other militaries on how to obey international law when they see these kinds of things. So it's, it matters in a whole series of different ways, but I think it also makes it more challenging if we're not making the case on an international legal basis for doing this, frankly, again, to basically promote the policy that Jake mm -hmm. was identifying, which is you know, about coming back to the table, about saying that we, in fact, do respect the commitments that we sign ourselves up to, that this is something that we want to pursue seriously and do so on an international basis. Yeah. So I think that's a, a sort of a broad piece. It does obviously come back also to the domestic legal authority. And there, I think that's been particularly challenging as well. I mean, we know how difficult it has been, I think, for Congress to assert itself. And, and some of that blame I put on Congress, and some of that blame I put on essentially the way the executive branch ultimately over, frankly, decades has sort of increased its authority and power in this space um, in the context of the war powers. But the way the, the analysis would go is essentially um, you would look at the action, so take the strike, for example, against Soleimani, and you would say, is this action something that constitutes a war from a constitutional sense, or is it something less than that? And the executive branch has set up a structure for essentially evaluating what constitutes a war from a constitutional perspective. And they say, basically, it has to do with what you anticipate to be the nature, the scope, and the duration of the conflict that is effectively planned as a consequence of this action. And if you end up in the space of it's a war from a constitutional perspective, then the Department of Justice has recognized that there is a limitation. In other words, under the Declaration of War Clause, the President of the United States is not allowed to act unless Congress has declared war. However, there is the exception in the context of self-defense, right? So you have sort of that structure. And there is some, at least, you know, arguments over how you would define self-defense in that particular frame, right? Then you get to below a war in a constitutional sense, which is frankly, 
every military intervention that we've seen for the last many decades, right? And what the Department of Justice has said is that there is a constitution, that basically the president has the authority under the constitution to take action in a military operation that goes below this level, right, where it's serving an important national interest and can do so without congressional authorization in advance and then essentially will make generally a war powers resolution report and then Congress has 60 days if you remain in hostilities to determine whether or not they're going to approve that action and give authority for continued use of force in that scenario or whether or not your troops are gonna to have to come back in a sense. But then of course there's all kinds of questions about whether or not you remain in hostilities and all those pieces yeah. to start. That was, that was a great overview. And I think it's an important to remind folks that these actions that we take, if we do it in the right way and with the right process, uh, could have some le more legitimacy and currently we're on very, very shaky grounds and that's the debate Congress is having. Uh, Jake, you, you mentioned something earlier about uh, the pathway forward and I'm gonna to try to take us there and maybe start with you and you guys can jump in on it. You mentioned uh, you saw the need to bring in the regional partners and link these discussions in a sense. And I think President Obama tried uh, to do this in inviting some of the leaders of the region to Camp David in 2015 and talk about measures on security front, but they weren't part of the nuclear deal conversation. My question is, is sort of, I think, a, a difficult one, uh, policy-wise, but then also politically for, for progressives. How do you bring these partners along when they're so flawed? when in their own actions, whether it's in the Yemen war or their own support for terror with some of the countries, or you see in Iraq, it's, it's very fragmented. And uh, there's divisions we saw on display in this vote in, in their parliament just in the past week. How do you actually execute that in this, in this moment? How do you make sure that you're also reassuring those partners about their very legitimate security concerns without doing what Trump has? done, which is give them a blank check, whether it's Saudi Arabia or, or most of the Gulf countries. You know, and I know it's, hard, it's a bit hypothetical. We're, we're moving from imaginary world where Donald Trump is no longer in the White House. How would you actually set a, a coherent policy process that, that links them in? Well, first, I do think that, for example, the U.S.-Saudi relationship is going to have to undergo a, a serious reexamination, whoever is elected. Um, if it, as long as it's not Trump, um, whoever the president is, uh, is going to take a hard look at that relationship and rebalance some of the elements of it, and that's to the good. And we've heard all the major Democratic presidential candidates speak about that in a way on the campaign trail, like we have not heard essentially since the foundation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And, and that is an important and legitimate thing to do from both a values and an interest perspective. The case that I would make is that a pure kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater with Saudi and just saying a pox on all your houses over there and forget it is not ultimately going to be constructive for US interests. That we have to find a way to talk to the Saudis about their legitimate security concerns, even as we hold them accountable for many of the illegitimate actions that they have taken. And critically, and I think this is the ingredient we just haven't either maybe had the opportunity or the wherewithal or, or the, the bandwidth to pursue, we need to have an honest conversation about what the regional outcome actually could look like yeah. at 30,000 feet yeah. and be real about it. Yeah. Okay, so on the one hand, you have Pompeo's 12 points, which is, I'm sure the Saudis and the, and the Emiratis and others would say, great, the Iranians out of Lebanon, cut ties with Hezbollah, out of Syria, stop everywhere, you know, great, perfect, but okay, come on. Yeah. Let's have a real conversation about the fact that Iran is a regional actor, will play a role in this region, and what is a role that is consistent with regional security architecture that can work? And that means pushing our partners not just to fall back on bromides about Iranian malign influence, things we all agree with, but saying, this is how I could see this actually playing out in a way where each side is de-escalating, where we're taking steps in places like Yemen, they're taking steps in places like Syria, what have you. And, and that's a, unfortunately for the US, it, it, part of the reason why I think that requires a regional to regional conversation is we can't broker this for them. Yeah. You know, we can't impose this on them, but we damn well can push the heck out of all of them, the Iranians too, to come to the table together yeah. And, and, you know, it's kind of the get real doctrine in a way. Uh -huh. Now, this isn't going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long time. But I think we would be making a mistake if we just say, 
we're just going to put that on the shelf, deal with the nuclear program, and just see what happens there. I think we want to be moving both of these at the same time while not holding the nuclear file hostage, hostage to, the regional. to the regional. Yeah, that's great. Ariane, we, we had a panel. You participated at CAP on uh, about two months ago, and it was de-escalation in the Middle East. And one of my friends just joked with me about, how's that working out for you? Uh, it didn't work out very well. Uh, but on the panel, we talked with Yasmin Farouk from Carnegie, and we had uh, Nimrod Goren from Mitvim in Israel. And we were talking about some of these uh, things that Jake had mentioned also in his previous, um, about the outreach from Saudi Arabia, UAE. Uh, Oman is constantly doing outreach, um, which is great, I think, and important. How do you see Iran responding to this? You know, uh, uh, this increased tension and then this outreach from some of the Gulf countries. Is, is there an opportunity to de-escalate in the region and start there first, or no? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, part of the Iranian strategy uh, since May 2019 uh, has been to obviously rise the, raise the cost of the maximum pressure campaign for the United States. But part of it has also been to drag other parties into this tension. Because what had happened uh, since essentially the beginning of this administration was that the United States was imposing um, costs on Iran. And Iran was the only one that was suffering essentially, right? Um, and the Europeans of course were upset, but you know, it wasn't really affecting them that much. Uh, the Gulf Arabs were um, not unhappy, some of them. Uh, Oman, Qatar being sort of outliers here, but the Saudis, the Emiratis were not unhappy. Uh, they had pushed for this sort of policy for a, for a while. And I think where the Iranians have actually been quite successful over the past few months is to show that you know, this is going to have implications for the region. And that's what we're saying, and that's what Jake was describing earlier on, that now we're seeing them actually try to take action uh, and, and try to return to the table. The Iranians had been wanting to get the, the Saudis uh, to come and negotiate with them. Uh, and of course, they, they wanted that because they felt like they were in a position of strength in the region. So let's not kid ourselves that you know, the, the Iranians are not doing it because they're being nice. It's because they feel like they're doing well in the region. Uh, but regardless, the Saudis were not really reciprocating. And now there is this overture, and I think it's, it, Jake is exactly right, that we can build on it, uh, that we can use this opportunity uh, and get the two sides to talk to each other because ultimately we're not, you know, we're, we're not gonna put a map of the Middle East on the table and divide it up between the US and Iran, right? It, this, is, this has to be a regional process, uh, and I think that this is a bit of a side effect of the maximum pressure campaign, um, it, but it has actually, there is a silver lining that the region, uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis are realizing that you, know, you can't just kind of kick Iran out of the region as they had said in the past. Uh, you have to deal with them, and if you're going to deal with them, you need to sit down and have a conversation about where the region goes next. Yeah. I I, I wish we had uh, more time. I need uh, to uh, pause here and uh, alert folks that have questions. We're going to have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions in a dialogue. Um, I think we're going to run till about 5. So uh, start thinking of your questions. I've got, I've got so many more I want to pick up on in terms of policy because it's such a rich topic in a short period of time. But I don't want to avoid this question, too, in terms of where are we in our national conversation on Iran and the politics and um, what Donald Trump does every day. And the question, in essence, is this. Um, we have a lot of expertise in the room, and many of which are trying to advise different candidates about how to talk about this. How do we avoid the trap of simply reacting to Donald Trump's atrocious, reckless actions, or things like his, what I think is a racist tweet uh, about the House, uh, uh, the Speaker of the House and the Senate um, uh, leader? Um, how do we do this in a way that isn't just in a, in a critical of him? We need to criticize. But how do we make this pivot and, and connect to some of these issues that we talked about earlier in this uh, conference of connecting and communicating with the American public? Because the formulas you've outlined, Jake, and we've talked about, I agree with. I think it's smart policy. But it's a bit more of a political question in how do we not get caught in that trap that I think Democrats were before CAP was founded back in 2002, 2003, of simply reacting to this global war on terror frame and trying to fit within that box. How do we do it also by not sounding like the status quo? Let's just go back uh, to 2015 and that's it. I think some of your comments have all indicated we need a better legal framework here. We need uh, better diplomacy and more, more connection with what Iranian people are, are talking about. But how do we avoid that type of conversation where we're just reacting? 
I'm going to start. I, I mean, I think, you know, you asked about the de-escalation, right? How's mm. it going, right? And here we are. And yeah. the irony, I think, to that, and, and very much building on Ariana's points, is that um, I think Trump doesn't want the situation to escalate, even though I think there are members of the Trump administration that have different views on how things should evolve, right? And yet, actually, by taking the maximum pressure route and not providing a diplomatic outlet, in effect, the only response, as has been identified for Iran, was really taking, you know, in responding to economic warfare, was to do the kind of destabilizing activities that we typically see them engage in, which has caused us to have to escalate, mm -hmm. right? Because now we've sent thousands of troops to the region to try to protect the, you know, our assets, our people, our all of these things, and and in fact, I mean, I think there is um, there's a way to have a conversation about this that is both. Uh, relevant to the um, uh, democratic progressive base as well as to the right, in a sense, which is to say that, you know, actually we need to have a measured approach in this space. We need to have a comprehensive policy and a real strategy that brings in allies and partners and folks in the region and so on in order to manage this situation so that we're not going down this road that forced us to send thousands of troops into harm's way that actually escalates the challenge that we're facing and that means that we end up spending more of our time and money and effort in this part of the world while we're dealing with a whole series of really important broad geopolitical strategies vis-a-vis -vis China, other things yeah. in this space. And I think that's a that may be a way, you know, a space within which to sort of drive the conversation to indicate that there's real value in the approach that um, that we've been describing. Just just to build on that, in in terms of the um, <clears throat> how we kind of make the case to the American people, because Trump's argument basically is, I killed a really bad guy with American blood on his hands, and people said there were going to be a lot of consequences, and there really weren't. It's all good. It's all good. People would be like, okay, all right, that makes sense. I think our response to that has to focus on interests in the region that people can get. We don't want Iran to get a nuclear weapon. We want to be able to continue to keep taking the fight to ISIS. And we don't want to get dragged further militarily into a region that has brought us nothing but military heartache. How are we doing on those three things? Iran is closer to a nuclear weapon than they were before. And they continue to make announcements in the wake, as, as Ariana was saying, in the wake of the Soleimani strike. We've suspended our counter ISIS operations because we've got to be protecting our embassies, thanks to Donald Trump deciding to take us down this road. And by the way, Iraq is even now talking about kicking us out, whether they do or they don't. They're going to put pressure on us to reduce our ability to go against terrorists. And in the, la in the last year, Iran, uh, the United States has sent 18,000 more troops to the Middle East. How is that? That's all Donald Trump deciding to tear up the Iran nuclear agreement and make life worse for us on three core things that should matter to the American people. What's his plan for any of that? For me, that gets us out of the, the toing and froing of what exactly will Iran do next yeah. or what exactly will Trump do next. It's just focus people in on those interests and, and the before and after, before these weren't problems, now they're problems because Trump made them problems. And he's got no plan for how to deal with it going forward. Um, and frankly, I have to say, I have been really impressed with the Democratic candidate response to this, essentially across <coughs> the board. I know there's been a little bit of, of back and forth among different campaigns, but if you think about 2004 or even 2008 to a certain extent, um, in 2004, everyone attacked Howard Dean for saying that capturing Saddam didn't make America safer. Democratic candidates did. And in 2008, while President Obama was strongly against the, the Iraq war, of course, he felt he had to be really all in on the Afghanistan war, to, almost to compensate, because we were still in this kind of war on terror frame as a candidate. The, the Democratic candidates this time around were like, uh-uh, this is crazy. Let's not do this. And none of them felt, I think, obliged to kind of say, um, you know, I don't know, maybe we have to get behind the president and what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that shows you, first of all, where we are in a kind of post post 9 right. 11 world and post war yeah. on terror frame. But it also shows you that the Democratic Party, 
um, is not going to take any guff from Donald Trump when it comes to trying to push them around on these issues yeah. of war. Just... Aaron, do you have anything else on, on this? I mean, I, I would highlight before we turn to questions, the polling, which we've talked about we did uh, last year, demonstrates what both of you just said that there's actually more consensus between sort of the more progressive, what we call them global activist camp, um, and those traditional internationalists on, on these issues. That it's yeah. important, I think, in, in the fight against, uh, arguing against Trump's conservative nationalism, to, to rem remember what sort of the common ties there are and the common arguments, even in the midst of a, a very sort of uh, tough primary fight for folks. So let's open it up. We've got a few questions, um, uh, time for questions here. Uh, raise your hand, uh, tell us who you are and uh, your affiliation, and um, if you want to direct your question to a particular panelist. Hi, my name is Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, and I would love you to hear what you think is going on with Iraq. Are, are, they going to pull, are we going to pull troops out? Are we going to stay there? Or? Iraq. Hmm. You want me to start? <laughs> I don't know. I, have to, I, mean. I mean, I don't, I, I'll stir, but I. Um, I think it's very hard for me to imagine that, uh, that we're able to stay at the presence that we are right now or in the way, in the frame that we are right now. I mean, I think the, the domestic politics are really challenging, obviously. Um, the council representatives have passed you know, this vote that basically says US troops have to leave. The prime minister is in a particularly weak scenario you know, as an acting caretaker, essentially, of the government and so on. And, and, uh, you know, and has asked for a delegation of folks to come over to talk about um, uh, the reduction and, and evacuation of troops, in a sense. And um, and I think, uh, you know, so there is going to have to be some version, essentially, some appropriate, you know, um, uh, work done on what a new presence might look like, if at all, and uh, you know, that is somehow satisfactory to the domestic politics that they're managing right now, even though I think there are people in the Iraqi government that would like us to remain in some form. Um, I think it's also, you know, th this, um, this situation is, again, ironic in the sense that Soleimani's greatest wish, right, with respect to Iraq was to get us out. And yet that's exactly what this situation is ultimately leading to in some form. And moreover, you know, uh, there are other forces at work here whereby we certainly saw the Russians try to move in, essentially, in terms of their influence um, in this space. And I suspect they're looking at this as an opportunity to do some more of that. Um, the NATO training mission has been suspended. Uh, you know, so effectively, our um, fight against ISIL is now you know, um, uh, significantly affected, if not at a standstill. And, uh, and so I think, you know, and that affects Iraq and their security and their ability to manage the situation um, within their own threats. So none of this, I think, has been good for Iraq or our relationship with Iraq, and I think um, we're going to face a fair number. Yeah. What else? If, yeah. if I could add just an endorsement of our colleague Daniel Benaim's analysis on, on Iraq. He's written it's a number terrific. of articles, and it's terrific. And it shows you sort of the investment, though many of us were against the Iraq war, uh, the Obama administration, those who went in, there's a deep understanding of the complexities there. And then the second thing I'd just say is, you know, you saw the reporting this morning, but just we were minutes away uh, from, apparently from independent reporting from Americans actually being killed Tuesday night, and that would have been a horrific right. moment. So this fiction of training versus combat troops, that the formulation, which I've used before in the past, that incident demonstrates how, how slippery and difficult it is for, for those thousands of uh, soldiers who are out there. Rob. Hi. Um, I'm Rob Deneen from the um, Future Diplomacy Project at the uh, Belfer Center at Harvard. Can you speak up a little bit? Sure. Uh, yeah. I won't, uh, Rob Denis. Uh, so, uh, Ariane, you, you gave a, you know, you explained how the regional response recently in the last few months has been to try to seek a modus vivendi with, with Iran of sorts. Paradoxically, that came about as a result of what was perceived to be a non-US response after Abqaiq in Saudi Arabia and other attacks on US shipping. And, and in, in a sense, the killing of Soleimani was an overcorrection from what had been seen as a under, response. And so, Jake, you had mentioned kind of in a future administration the, the need to return to, to diplomacy. But while we were busy watching Soleimani, Trump abrogated 40 years of bipartisan policy, first in, you know, articulated as the, as the Carter Doctrine, which was to protect the flow of shipping in the Gulf. Do you see 
the democratic response to be to reestablish the Carter Doctrine and have the Gulf be of, of vital interest to U.S. policy, or it would seem to me uh, easy to slip into, a, in a sense, a continuity with the with you know what Trump has actually started, which was, um, if you will, more consistent with what would, could be framed as a retreat from the region or a pivot away from it. Look, I think there is a general sense. Uh, on the Democratic side, across the candidates, um, that the United States <laughs> needs to really follow through on the concept of rebalance and put more emphasis on a great power competition with China and Russia, on climate change, on a, uh, global corruption efforts, on a whole series of things that don't implicate the security situation in the Middle East. And so there will be a gravitational pull away from the United States kind of making the flagship kind of foreign policy and national security initiative of a new administration be some major play in the Middle East. However, I also believe that all of the Democrats are deeply invested in the diplomacy that led to the Iran deal and in reviving the basic bargain of nuclear restrictions for sanctions relief that lay at the heart of that deal and stopping Iran from getting a nuclear weapon through peaceful means and that the situation they will confront in trying to disentangle militarily from the region actually presents opportunities for diplomacy that, again, are not, should not be held hostage to but can be connected to that nuclear engagement that I think are pretty, a pretty appealing type of diplomacy can come out of this where it's not just the United States. I mean, many other actors, not just the regional players among themselves, Obviously, the Russians are a factor in the region and, and, and other countries, too. So I think in a funny way, even though there will be this kind of psychological shift away from the Middle East towards other things, there will also, people will see the genuine opportunity for old-fashioned American diplomacy to play a real role in not just securing a nuclear agreement going forward, but also in dealing with this set of issues around the region that if we don't have some answer for, we'll find a way, as they did at the end of the Obama administration, of pulling us back in. Um, the only thing standing between us and drinks is Kelly Magsman. Um, the hour has reached us <laughs> at, at 5 p.m. Um, you have final remarks? <laughs> Katrina <laughs> Mulligan. I've been known to make mistakes before. <laughs> so uh, please uh, join me in thanking the panel first. Oops. And welcoming Katrina Mulligan.